Will that work? That will work. Oh, okay, cool. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's been a lovely day so far. Are you ready to uh, round out this uh, this middle session? I am. Thank you. Okay. Share my screen here and away we go. All right. Well, thanks everyone for having me and uh, thanks to anybody I know out there. And thanks for putting this together, Paul and Elizabeth. Let's talk about how we over here at Denver Public Schools utilize PostGIS to bring about every system you can think of to enable us to support the demographic planning for Denver Public Schools. So as you can imagine, it's been a very tumultuous couple of years, and it was a very tumultuous couple of years before that. And we imagine a few more to come before things start to settle down, if they would. When, before we get going, I should say, a lot of the maps and stuff that we do, I can't actually show folks. So I struggle a lot with how to share our work since it all often ends up displaying the location of a student household. So let me try to summarize a lot of the work that we do by stepping back out to the city level and getting a sense of the tools that we use within our day-to-day -day operation. One of the themes that came to me through one of our team meetings this last month was the notion that we at the center of our team kind of connect not just systems and organizations within Denver Public Schools, but within the city, county, and state as well. And as I'll show you, a lot of that has to do with everything passing through a post-GIS database and a Postgres database for that matter. Within DPS, there's a bunch of different teams that manage all the student information that we rely on, their safety and security, their food services, there's the BI team, the enterprise data team, on and on and on. We tend to answer a lot of questions to do with data, but we answer everything that has to do with spatial data. And again, PostGIS is the enabler of that. And we'll talk about how we create that data, maintain that data, visualize, analyze, and everything we do with that data, all thanks to PostGIS. Across Denver and the city and county in the state, we're involved with a number of different conversations that rely on us giving data to groups or us taking data from groups, analyzing, visualizing, and either returning back to the client, visualizing to the public or anybody within the district itself. And again, PostGIS is the perfect platform to allow us to communicate with different systems, again, within DPS, different database types, different data formats and pull them all into our system and use them as we need. Within DPS, we rely on data that lives in a giant SQL Server database, Microsoft SQL Server database. And actually, I'll talk about the fact that PostGIS was a great tool for education for us to learn how these relational databases work. And as I'll say, when you come from GIS, you don't necessarily understand what relational data is and how you can really use it. With that said, PostGIS allows us to communicate with all the databases within Denver Public Schools, including some that really only are touched at the GUI level. And we had a problem with our transportation database where we had to go in and figure out which streets in their system required a prefix for the north and east streets. This is a real problem we had where the city and county kind of never kept track of that before, but it started getting used more and more and the city officially adopted it, but we had to change all the data in the transportation system. Boom, we can connect to that back end of that SQL Server database and actually visualize in QGIS where that data needed to be updated and send a SQL query back to the source to be able to update that data. We'll look at how we utilize open data from a couple sources, the city and county specifically to leverage a lot of our processes internally. We connect to the OSRM, or OSM, uh, open source routing machine. Yes, open source routing machine as well. I always get the OSM and OSRM confused. And we are actually big users of Google Drive, not just for presentations, but also to drive some of our data charting, analytics, and visualizations, visualizations as well. And as you can see, our data ends up from PostGIS getting back into a lot of places as well. And the ease of use is, with all of this, the compatibility, and just the various tools built into the PostGIS system all make this possible. So I've come from the GIS world, but now I'm living in the spatial data world. And the spatial data world is a lot nicer. It's easier to work with. It makes a lot more sense. It's more powerful. And it actually gets people thinking a lot more about, well, I have this data. It's in an Excel sheet right now. But oh, I understand now that if a student ID is attached to a household or a school number is attached to a geometry point, how can I re-ask a question that maybe before it was, oh, if the GIS could do it, I could get an answer. But now, I can get an answer from 
the planning team because they can pretty much do anything with a map. So the big problem we had to crack open when we were building our system is, well, a GIS used to do this, but a relational database with spatial data can actually do much more. And that's our kind of MO as it were. A lot of this involved figuring out why we don't need spatial data everywhere, but we need everything to be spatially enabled. And as I take one of the random database diagrams from our student information system, we can see that, well, without going into the details, that not a lot of this, in fact, none of this information is spatial. That is, there's no geometry in any of these tables. But by the way of the relational database, specifically, as I mentioned, an address ID or student ID, every single data point within the student information system can be spatially enabled. So as before, a test score, a demographic point, a free and reduced lunch status, anything like that that resides in somebody else's data can be read by our post-GIS system, attached spatial data when we need it, and any kind of mapping spatial analysis can be done through our post-GIS system. Along with this comes the whole conversation about free and open source software. So again, having come from GIS, you'll understand that from a GIS perspective, well, open source has a lot of parts, you gotta put it together. And then once it's together, who's gonna put it back together when it falls apart and so on and so forth. But really that's not been our experience. Free and open source for us means a good piece of software that works and communicates with every system it needs to perfectly because it's built by a community of people around the world who want to see that software work the best it can. So again, for me, it's downloading, installing, connecting, and going, going along with my work. And that's been our experience on our shorter team and our broader team as we start to share and expand the use of our spatial data. Let's take a look at a couple examples of some of the tools and applications that we utilize to get our day-to-day -day work done. So no fancy picture here with Postgres and PostGIS. I'm sure everybody knows what most of these things are. Some of the highlights for us come with, again, having SQL and everything that comes with it in our system. Geoprocessing is not something that we do anymore. We do all of our spatial analysis in the database. We don't use any desktop GUIs. I mean that to say QGIS, we don't use any model building or dialog boxes. We're using SQL spatial. One of our favorite things that we use for a lot of our SQL analysis is called common table expressions or CTEs. Uh, a lot of our SQL work is really ad hoc queries. We may have a question come down from the superintendent, from senior leadership, from board of education, from the mayor's office, from a member of the public or whomever it might be. And it just as easy as opening up a SQL dialogue and just running a query and getting a result. The result might be a map, the result might be a table, a chart, but it's all running through our post-GIS system. Goes without saying, obviously having spatial data in a relational database is the key to victory here, spatial functions. And although it's a small word, the logic again of SQL and how you analyze, process your data is just such an invaluable skill to learn from Postgres, from PostGIS as well. And again, something that we never really got to understand using just GIS. A lot of the examples I'll show you are leveraging the foreign data wrapper capabilities. So again, we mentioned connecting to SQL Server databases, connecting to Google Sheets to read data, but also dumping data back to a Google Sheet to drive other charting and reporting, which I'll mention. We also look at the city and county of Denver and several other open data portals, which basically operate as tables within our database thanks to foreign data wrappers. And the easiest way to connect to the multitude of Postgres databases that we have up and running in our dev QA and production environments also utilize foreign data wrappers as well. We'll talk about our geocoding process and how full text search has really just completely changed the whole notion of geocoding. We utilize materialized views quite a bit as well, which if you're not familiar, are basically a table connected to a bunch of dynamic data sources that we refresh on a daily basis versus dropping, rec dropping and recreating or truncating and loading. We simply say refresh. And another fancy thing that we've started using is PG Cron, which is a more advanced kind of server automation, process automation uh, tool, which I'm kind of learning about, but our team is well versed in this. Now, SQL, as I mentioned, is a new thing for anybody using coming from the GIS world. And again, we're not doing any raster data processing, terrain analysis, or any kind of thing to do 
with that fancy stuff. So we can live within a relational database utilizing Postgres, PostGIS, SQL queries. But the tool that we need to do this, we've been leaning on is called dbvert, and I highly recommend it. And it's got all the things that you need from any modern coding environment to make that experience more directed towards the analyst versus some of the other tools that are more geared towards the database, database administrator. We also noticed that, well, we kind of borrowed from the idea, and I'm not sure about the code, from PG Admin when they got a spatial viewer, we kind of went to GitHub and said, Deep Beaver, would you mind putting in a spatial viewer? And lo and behold, they did it. And so we have this wonderful place to connect, talk to, analyze our Postgres, PostGIS database, and also see the spatial data just as any other numerical or text data as well. As I mentioned, the ability to use dbeaver versus SQL Server Administrator or um, Management Studio, PG Admin, they're not as user friendly they're very powerful, but when you have a new user who's not necessarily well-versed in SQL, dbeaver is a perfect tool to get someone up and running with SQL. It's, again, user-friendly, looks good. You can see your results and it just, again, looks like one of the modern code writing tools that we're all used to these days. We also utilize some of the Git tools to manage projects when required. And of course, when you do need database administrative tools, you can find them in dbeaver as well. We've also been writing some custom functions. This is something that Jeff on our team has been really just going above and beyond with. We'll talk about the geocoding tools in here, but one thing we did end up creating was a ST geocode function to be able to utilize the full text search that we have sitting in the database to run ad hoc geocoding requests, which again is utilizing city and county of Denver and other authoritative data sources in the state of Colorado. For routing, as much as I love PG routing, we've landed on the OSRM system to handle some much bigger routing tasks and really using OpenStreetMap as the backend data using OSRM on a Docker hosted server. We created the ST routed distance function, we call it, to be able to communicate over HTTP to that OSRM server and do, well, we can route 94,000 students to from their home to their attend school. And I think it's taking like 14 seconds to do all those kids. We do a lot of transportation analysis for bus routing and make, uh, transportation matrices of students and bus stops and all these types of things as well. The ST, ST routed distance function returns the time of the route, the length of the route, and of course the geometry. And the little picture we're showing here is just dbeaver with a, sort of a mock-up of students, the routes and the school that they're all getting routed to. So three types of geometry in that spatial data viewer in dbeaver. Obviously QGIS is a wonderful tool. Don't let me get down on the other tools that are in there just because we don't use them. But QGIS for us is a way to visualize the work that we've created in our PostGIS databases. So an invaluable tool to let us see what's going on to make our maps. Uh, we'll talk about where we go on the web. A lot of our analysis and ad hoc queries and questions get answered by a single static image, which comes from QGIS. The visualization tools in here for hotspots, for just basic cartography, advanced cartography, and you name it. Uh, are always at our disposal and are always open on our desktop along with the Beaver to talk to PostGIS. Uh, there is now the ability to store your QGIS projects in Postgres database, which we love. And again, just having a tool to rapidly create maps whenever a question needs to be answered is invaluable. As I mentioned before, the last couple of years have been incredible with the pandemic and having all these tools at our disposal has been a game changer to be able to rapidly pivot work to something completely different but using the same data that we have in our database already. Our boundaries, our regions, our students, our schools, uh, loading in data from the state health department, loading in data from somebody else's Excel list, reading a Google Sheets, cranking it all into PostGIS, doing an analysis, getting a picture quickly out through QGIS of that PostGIS data for the first year and a half of the pandemic, especially the first year where nobody really knew what was gonna happen. We had just questions coming in and we didn't even know where the answer was going, but we had the tools to be able to answer them. So thank you is an understatement for having these tools to all the developers, but thank you. When we connect to the web, there's all kinds of different ways of doing this. As you know, our tools of choice, since we have 
the wonderful Jeffrey Bradley on our team now, who's taken everything that I thought may be kind of sort of possible for the web. He says, I've already done it. Meaning that he's an incredible developer who's been able to stay well-formatted data in a Postgres, Post.js database with our Node.js. He uses Vue.js, PG TileServe, PG FeatureServe, cranking it out through a leaflet map box map, allows us to do things like track residential development permits. And this drives the work that we'll talk about with our forecast. So we get development permits coming in from the city. We have in the background a view that materialized view that tells us here's your historical enrollment for the last five years. Here's how many students we would get out of that type of development. Here's what we expect to get from this development based on the number of units, the types of units and the location. Again, the front end of grabbing those residential developments is our web application, dumps it right into Postgres, automatically geocodes the points and spits out a number for us that we would then interact with the developer for land and fees. Of course, there's GeoServer and GeoServer is my favorite only because I don't necessarily get the complexities of the technology using Node and, and Vue. But the first time I ever got a GeoServer publicly facing connected to a Postgres server, it was wonderful. We can now distribute data to a vendor we have in California that handles our choice and enrollment process. And we can also share data to some of the local data portals, such as the Colorado Information Marketplace, where we can have our boundaries, board districts, and schools automatically distributed through GeoServer, oops, automatically distributed through GeoServer and pumped right out to their open data portal so that anybody who needs to get that can get that updated on a daily basis. So you can see the date in the bottom there from when I pulled that slide. So they're pulling from a dynamic GeoServer link directly to a PostGIS database that I'm ETLing to on a daily basis for any changes that got made. So speaking of the automation, Python is a wonderful tool for connecting to a database and moving data around. Again, PostGIS is doing all the work in the background, but Python is able to take that work and dump it to another database. We work in a very sort of rigorous dev QA and production environment, which we learned from the DBAs here at DPS. We also dump data down to Microsoft SQL Server databases, and we utilize Python to read Postgres database, Postgres PostGIS data, I should say, we can read that data, transform the geometry to text, transform it to a different coordinate system for SQL Server Spatial, and then dump it into a SQL Server database that can then feed into some views of that geometry or feed directly to other teams within DPS. We use cron on a CentOS server for now, and we have all these tasks automated that run every day after the rest of the processes in the enterprise have all finished running and we can go ahead and grab new addresses, grab today's student list, pass our boundaries on through, pass our geocoded data through, and so on and so forth. So the Python libraries that you talk to SQL Server, and, or sorry, that talk to Postgres, the Cycle PG2 library allows us to also say stuff like, well, just refresh that materialized view or refresh the table that needs that open data that we've got through a foreign data wrapper or go get whatever's in that Google sheet today. And GitLab, of course, is our favorite tool internally for managing all the Python scripts that we deploy to our production ETL servers. So GitLab, again, wonderful tool for us to be able to say, here's all the Python files that talk to all of our databases. We've developed them. We've gone through the you know, get changes and everything we've done. We've tested it in QA, and now we can deploy that to prod by simply going to the prod database and saying, get pull. Or you can use some of the auto deploy features that come with GitLab as well. And that is gonna be another tool for you to simply leave your hands off of a lot of this stuff that just runs on a daily basis. Some of the processes that we built that utilize all these tools, well, geocoding is no longer guessing. We have all the data. We know the city and county is maintaining all the address points in the city, as are all the other counties surrounding us. Anytime an address comes in for a new student, for a new household, it's already in that list. We don't have to guess. We don't have to plot it somewhere down the street on the left or the right. I just need to max match the input text with the text in that point file. Boom. That's my geocoding process. Student addresses, employee addresses, and of course, any ad hoc requests that come from someone's spreadsheet of who knows who's students. Again, open addresses is the tool that kind of grabs all of the address data that we 
need and check it out if you haven't already because there's a lot around the world now especially the city and county of denver for us and other address sets around the state a nice thing with this whole process is that we can use python to generate email summaries that come to us every morning so we know we know it's 10 o'clock because we get an email report that tells us how many geocodes went through today how many did not go through and which ones didn't go through and what the database actually thinks the text should be. So we can send that back to our data quality management team and say, oh, a little mistake in here. And then the next day, geocode is just fine. So with that, geometry from every address that we geocode goes straight to Power BI users in the form of a lat long in our WGS84 coordinate system. But as I said, we throw a lot of it down to SQL Server in state plane, just because if you don't know SQL Server, it doesn't handle spatial stuff too well, though there are some tools that do it. Again, some of the results of our spatial processes may just be a number for which boundary a student resides in, and that gets passed into the information system as well. And of course, geometry for every student in the district gets used in our active student table that's refreshed every day, scatter plot maps, where do these students live in this boundary or this neighborhood, or I need to have a list of languages spoken by students that live between these four streets. All of this is easily done through SQL with PostGIS. One big thing that we do is a forecast on a five-year date basis. We are taking historical enrollment for the last five years, historical yields from parcel types, as I talked about, residential developments. We get data for where every child is born in the city every year. We pump that into our database as well. All that summarized at the census block group level, and I won't speak too much about the actual process that goes into that, but needless to say, it's all done in PostGIS to spit out at our block group level or our sub-region level, I should say, the elementary and middle and high forecast for five years. So this goes into a multitude of reports throughout the district. Least likely the, or at least, nevertheless, the strategic regional analysis. This is the yearly report that we have created now within the Google Drive system. And this is a big deal for us because PostGIS is gonna do all the work processing all the data, creating all the pre-cooked data tables that we can dump to Google Drive through a foreign data wrapper. From there, we can drive all of our charting, which then goes into the slides, which then allows us to create a dynamic link to our report. Next year, when we have new enrollment data, new birth data, new development data, we simply are driving everything off of a year value in another data table. We can hit refresh on the SQL, materialized view that's going to get dumped to google sheets and then boom the sra gets updated and we can simply go through and structure our language around the changes that we see based on that data another very niche example but a very powerful one is how we place students in some of our special education department and special education centers there's a team of people that utilizes one of our web applications to type in an address of a student and by the program type and ed level that is required of that student, get a list of the schools that they have available to them based on their location, grade, and program needs. So that allows them to see where that student should go. And again, reading data from Google Sheets, reading from SQL Server, getting an idea of the capacity of that school and how much room they have is going to determine where that student gets placed. So and one more example out of the COVID response was the food distribution. This was a big deal. So making sure that every student, even if they were learning at home during the worst of the pandemic, still had access to breakfast and lunch was a big deal for our food services department. Data that was being stored in Google Sheets about how many lunches were being served, how many were not being served, allowed them to rapidly figure out, do we need to make changes to our delivery sites? Having all this in a dashboard that food services was able to use allowed them to make their changes in a Google Sheet, but then see the results on a map and see where their efforts needed to be changed, if any. So last week I had the opportunity to speak to the University of Colorado GIS crew across the state. And having come through GIS and now being where I am with spatial data, there's some things that GIS didn't teach me that we rely on every day to get done our spatial analysis. So again, relational data, this is not really a thing. Not everything is spatial, as I mentioned. There's addresses and schools and boundaries. In fact, it's not just schools, it's buildings. Everything relates to each other, to build the schools, to build the active student list, to do the geocoding. Things like primary keys and spatial indices, not 
ignored by GIS, but not something that's really taught as in you need to know this for your data to work. Something as simple as a view, super handy, materialized view, super handy, not coming through the GIS curriculum. An actual SQL, not just pseudo or dialog box SQL in filters and so forth. Learn actual SQL. I like to use this little quote, who knows where this developer is, but he is an expert is in you are creating telecommunications startup. So you obviously know a lot more than me. And I heard him say at the bar, not talking to me, that most coding languages are just wrappers around SQL. So get some data, get it in a good shape, get it in a good database and off you go. And lastly, my message to anybody looking to find a quote unquote GIS job is to find a company or organization that needs spatial data rather than going out and finding a GIS analyst job because you're not gonna find the budget or the personnel to find the GIS analyst, senior GIS analyst, but you will find a lot of people that need spatial in their organization. So with that, I'll wrap up. And if there's any questions, we can take a couple of minutes here if I haven't gone too long. Yeah, no, you got times left. Um, and there's a couple in the, uh, in the Q and A. Okay. Um, so uh, the first one from Philip Hurwitz, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on text search, full text search for geocoding? Um, well, you know, Paul has done some incredible job documenting the basics of this, and I can only defer to what he's put out there as well. If there is, as in the first question, a place that we can publish some of this information, I'm happy to put it on our GitLab, or sorry, GitHub publication, GitHub page. Uh, but I won't be showing you much more than Paul's already put together for that full text search. So basically the functions are within our process and our queries to say, uh, you know, select full text search on this, these sets of columns or this aggregated column of address information only to return the result from the table that I'm querying to then say, yep, that's the match. And there's our geometry associated with that. Probably doesn't answer the question, but I'm not going to, again, do much more than what Paul's already put out there, which is super helpful for us learning this stuff. Um, the question just disappeared there about the routing. Um, do we use AWS, AWS to download from open addresses? They recently changed their system, and I think there's now a manual step that they forced into the process for us to do a manual download of some of that stuff. And I think it had to do with AWS and how they were, they used to put that stuff out there for, basically wide open to anybody to query, but it sounds like they had some issues with people taking advantage of that and had to lock it down a little bit further. So whether or not AWS or how AWS is involved in that, I couldn't say exactly. And yeah, there was a question about um, OSRM and your implementation, I guess, just a question on whether you could, uh, whether it's public or you can show it or is there a GitHub on it? The, yeah, I mean, I could share the um, creation of the function that, talks to that open OSRM server, because I think that Jeff Chase basically set up a basic OSRM server, and then the, fu the function that communicates to it has got the, you know, the HTTP URL to there and how we pass in the geometry and how that's formatted to then come back with an answer. So happy to put that up on, uh, I'll, I'll tweet that out and put it on our, our GitHub page as well for that. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for uh, coming and, and sharing your experience with all of us. Thank it's, you for having me. Talk. Good to see you. Thanks, Elizabeth, again. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Um, so uh, 